Hello, and welcome to Third Thursday at Hoover's, and thank you for joining us again this evening. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. And before I start this program, I'd like to share some upcoming events with you. On Sunday, June 26th, we'll host our first public author talk in two years. In fact, it's probably been a lot longer than two years, so we're happy to have it. Our regular Third Thursday viewers may recall last month's program with author and historian Annette Dunlap, who spoke to us about Lou Henry Hoover's White House years. Well, we're bringing Annette here all the way from Portland to talk about our newly released biography of Lou Henry Hoover. It begins at 2 p.m. at the Hoover Presidential Library in the Figgy Auditorium. And Annette will stay after the program uh, to visit with you and sign copies of her book, which will be on sale at the library. We hope you'll come and enjoy the afternoon presentation. Hopefully you've heard something about our biggest news. We'll be hosting President George W. Bush at our annual celebration banquet on October 7th in Cedar Rapids. We have just begun accepting table sponsorships and we expect tables to sell out quickly. If you're interested in attending this special event, please visit our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org and scroll down to the home page to see the home uh, banquet links. We hope you'll join us this fall uh, at the banquet. Individual seats, uh, if available, will go on sale in August at Hoover's Hometown Days in person here at the Rummel Center. Just keep an eye on the website for further details. Also on our website, you can learn about a major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum exhibit space. It's been nearly 30 years since the last renovation, and we're excited to bring about new technology and other updates to the museum. We have a special benefit for Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values Campaign, where you can earn a 25% tax credit on your Iowa State taxes for your gift of any size. Now tonight, I'm pleased to welcome Ann Robertson to the program. Anne is the volunteer historian for the Girl Scout Council of the nation's capital and founder of the Girl Scout History Project blog and digital museum. She earned a PhD in political science from George Washington University and is a lifetime member of the Girl Scouts and has earned the gold award and the thanks page. Her program will highlight the role Lou Henry Hoover played in the early stages of the Girl Scouts and its continued mission. I invite you to attend, or excuse me, I invite you to enter questions for Anne at any time during the program through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you'd like to hear those answered, as we may not have time to answer all the questions provided, top vote getters will be asked first. Thank you for joining us tonight, Anne. I've heard all, we had a few Girl Scouts in the audience tonight, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to learning more about Lou's role in the early years of the Girl Scout organization. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here tonight and look forward to um, educating everyone about Lou, about Lou. She is definitely the unsung hero of Girl Scouting. We have a very special fondness for her here at Nation's Capital, since she spent so much time with us, um, both as a as First Lady and as wife of the Secretary of Commerce and so many other functions that she had in her life. Uh, we have this wonderful portrait uh, that you see here that is looks looks down upon all of us uh, in downtown Washington. Uh, we've had a picture, I think since the 30s, because you can see here um, an earnest staff meeting planning out new troops and new strategies with Lou watching very carefully. Most people can only name one famous Girl Scout, and that's Juliet Gordon Lowe. Every Girl Scout handbook and every first meeting tells the same story about how Juliet created the Girl Scouts. It goes something like this. The Girl Scout movement was born on March 12, 1912, when Juliet Gordon Lowe placed a telephone call to her cousin. Come right over, she announced. I've got something for the girls of Savannah and all America and the world, and we're going to start it tonight. Beginning with 18 enthusiastic girls in Savannah, troops rapidly popped up across the country. Now this official portrait portrays Lowe as a master of multitasking. She assembles troops, trains, leaders, writes handbooks, sews badges, gives speeches, and designs uniforms. 
Now, while she's rightly credited as the driving force in the Girl Scout movement, she did not do it alone. She would bring her infectious enthusiasm for her new program to hundreds of cities, but she then turned day-to-day -day operations over to local women that she knew through personal connections. But for Girl Scouts to be a lasting organization, it could not be a one woman show. We had a founder with Juliet, but Lou helped us build a foundation for the organization and the movement that is now 110 years old. Lou first became interested in the Girl Scouts as it related to her food and war relief efforts during World War I. Uh, here in Washington uh, and across the country, Girl Scouts were encouraged to go out and plant community gardens. Um, here in Washington, they dug up the grounds around the Daughters of the American Revolution office and around the National Mall. So she was very interested in the movement and in the goals and in seeing the types of service projects that girls could give, not just to individuals, but to communities as a whole. She really became involved though, as he said, in 1917. And that is when Washington, the Washington area began to create a Girl Scout Council. Now the first troop was created in Washington in late 1913. And the idea was when the community got, oh, like four troops or 100 girls together, it was time to open an office and get a professional staff person to do the work for consistency. And you applied for a charter to the national organization. Juliet Lowe immediately, when she thought of starting in Washington, of having a commissioner, uh, the president of the new Girl Scout office, she turned to Lou. Lou easily begged off quickly saying, um, I'll, I'll be vice chair, I'll be anything honorary that you want, I just don't have time for this. But she had an idea of somebody who might work. Uh, a couple of months ago, she'd run into another active uh, club woman in Washington. Her name is Henrietta Bates Brook. And when I say they ran into each other, I mean that literally. They had a traffic accident around I Street. Uh, Mrs. Brook was well known in Washington for her various efforts. So Lou decided she would come to her house to ask her what, if she was interested. Unfortunately, Mrs. Brook was home with a severe case of appendicitis and completely and completely defenseless. She said being in no physical condition to deny any request. Mrs. Hoover quickly persuaded me to build a council. So when I got well, that's what I had to do. In fact, the, continue, the continuance of the, of the Washington Council also went by several different ruses. Um, for the first meeting for recruitment for adults to lead the Girl Scouts, um, Mrs. Brooke invited friends over to see um, an art collection uh, known by uh, a rather wealthy couple here in Washington. The women got inside, they looked at the art, they had tea. Then Mrs. Brooke locked the door and said, no one is leaving until they sign up for a troop. And that is how Washington became a, a Girl Scout Council. Lou became even more closely interested and active with the Girl Scouts in 1922. This is a picture that was taken in the backyard of her house in Georgetown. And here uh, with a bouquet of flowers is a famous Girl Scout leader in Washington named Helen Hopkins Zeloff. Helen is famous because she received the, um, the Bronze Cross Medal of Valor for the, from the Girl Scouts. In Washington, we just had a 100th anniversary celebration back in January of the worst snowstorm in the history of Washington. There was a theater, a movie cinema that was open the night of the, the snow. And as, as the show was beginning, the roof suddenly collapsed under the weight of 30 inches of snow. Helen survived, although the people around her didn't, but she kept her wits about her, recalled all of her first aid training, and was able to call out when she first heard the rescuers come. Not only did she save herself, but she was able to lead rescuers to the location of 10 other people. The national organization commended her with Lou as president writing, by your heroism, you have set us a perfect example of courage, of self-control in extreme danger and pain, of resourcefulness and of self-sacrifice in the service of other people. The whole Girl Scout sisterhood sends you deep sympathy for your, the sorrow and loss that came to you and most heartfelt admiration and gratitude for the heroism you showed. 
What you did during that night fills every one of your sister scouts with pride and with the desire to live more nobly, to be worthy of you and of the credit you have brought to our movement. This is the same award that was presented posthumously to Amory Jo Garza um, in Ovalde, Texas in that incident. So we had the wonderful ceremony in, in Lou's backyard that gave the cross, presented it to Helen. Uh, that's all of her troop, all of her girls around her, Troop 8 of Washington. Now the thing also in going on at this time was Helen was about to get married and she was going to be moving to Philadelphia. And therefore a new leader needed to be found for Troop 8 and Lou volunteered. It grew to be one of the largest troops in Washington, primarily of high school age girls. And Lou was so enthused and so interested in their lives that unusually the girls would come back from college and continue having meetings. We couldn't get them out of Girl Scouts quick enough. Um, they wanted to stay earning badges. But of course, even when you're meeting at the White House, you don't get special treatment with the Girl Scouts. You have to do your paperwork. You have to stay involved. And this is one of my uh, favorite artifacts that we have about Lou saying, some things never change. You got to get your paperwork in on time. We're going to talk about Helen again later, so, so keep her in mind. Lou is unusual for serving as not only the elected president of the Girl Scouts of the United States, as well as the honorary president of the Girl Scouts. First ladies, since Edith Wilson, all except one, have been the national honorary president. And in that role with Washington Girl Scouts, it, it brings an extra level of involvement within the movement because the first lady is able to attend more events or sponsor more events at the White House. But the first time that Lou came in was in 1922 when she was elected president of the Girl Scouts. And she at that time was realizing that despite Juliet's enthusiasm, her recruiting methods were starting to create some problems. She did rely on personal connections at first to recruit people. And that made it increasingly sort of an upper class, East Coast, um, small group. And Lou wanted to immediately break that up to democratize Girl Scouting, to bring in more girls from all income levels. And most importantly, to make Girl Scouting a career. She was part of the movement in the 20s to set up training schools for Girl Scout professional women, young women who would attend these summer institutes at universities across the country. Uh, Stanford was one, for example, um, where they would get their initial training and in how to manage girls, how to lead troops and how to train and recruit adults and then go out starting, um, starting different councils and supporting councils as needed across the country. So she wanted to make sure of increasing the way uh, the councils and headquarters communicate. Technically, Girl Scouts is organized really as a federation. We have the national organization, and right now there are about 100 councils. And most people think those councils are subsidiaries, but they're not. They're independently governed nonprofit organizations with their own boards of directors. And increasingly, even in those early days, you were receiving your orders from New York and were expected to implement them. And early on, Lou wanted to shift that direction of work so that councils and even individual members were able to feel that they had a voice in the movement and in making decisions about policies and implementing those as well. She did that initially by trying to get Lillian Gilbreth to be the national president of the organization. She begged off saying that she had no time, but quickly, okay, I'll volunteer. I'll spend a little time at the office and see what you're doing. And 20 years later, she was still an active Girl Scout volunteer and a member of the board of directors. Um, Lillian, if you're not aware of who exactly she is, was um, a time in motion um, expert, finding best ways of efficiently operating homes, efficiently operating factories, whatever you need to. Um, she's also best known as um, the subject of the Cheaper by the Dozen book and movie, um, which was written by two of her children. When you have 12 kids, I suppose you have to be extremely organized to get everyone in and out of the door every day. 
Lou also wanted to find other ways of recruiting and advertising the Girl Scouts. She was able to arrange for a $500,000 grant from the World War I Relief Board that was still left over in the 20s. The fact that her husband still was chair of it probably uh, played part of a role, but she used, she used that to invest in training and to invest in materials for the girls. The girls had had a magazine since 1914, really, but Lou saw it grow and to make sure that it was not only relevant to all teens across the country, but to make sure it promoted Girl Scouting as many ways as possible. Um, the publication continued um, up until the late 70s. Um, and um, it's, it's a real shame that it hasn't continued. Uh, it has wonderful artwork, wonderful content. Uh, Lou also promoted a series of fiction books that told tales about different Girl Scout troops. Um, there were well over 20 that were published. Most of them were written by the same ghostwriter who did the Nancy Drew series. Um, but two of the books were actually written by Lou's sister as well. Now, one of the biggest marks that Lou had on Washington was in relation to this thing called the Better Homes Movement. This was a theory in the early 1920s that American housewives should have um, the most up-to-date, most technologically sophisticated um, kitchens and houses they could to maximize their time and to be able to create healthier, happier families in stronger communities. This led to the creation of the Better Homes Movement. That was the collaboration between the, Secretary, between the Department of Commerce um, and the um, Greater Federation of Women's Clubs. And the Better Homes Movement started by having a demonstration week every year, uh, which was simply to show new products and such. But in 1923, they got very ambitious and decided they were going to build a model home on the National Mall where visitors could go through and see all of this wonderful ways of improving their life. Um, everything, every appliance, every uh, piece of furniture uh, was, was donated. Um, there was a brochure that went along with it. So you know what, what uh, manufacturer they came from if you wanted to go through and buy your own. But here we have um, Secretary of Commerce Hoover uh, breaking ground. It's for Sherman Square, which is actually behind the US Treasury building. The plan was to build the house and have it on the mall available for about two weeks. Um, they had actually strategized and scheduled those two weeks when there was supposed to be the National Convention of the Shriners in Washington. And they thought all of the Shriners wives would need something to do and therefore they would come out and see the little house. When it was completed, the design was based on that of John Howard Payne, who had composed this popular song, uh, Home Sweet Home. The final building had a uh, modern kitchen, breakfast nook, three bedrooms, a nursery, and two bathrooms. Um, the first week of the exhibit, an average of 3,000 people visited the house every day. It was so popular, they extended another week or two so that people could see it. But then the question came up of what do we do with this house now? They went to um, the, the Better Homes officials who had uh, been in charge of this project, raised the issue with the Secretary of Commerce and Lou was there on the spot immediately ready. She thought this was going to be perfect for the Girl Scouts. The problem was, well, where are you gonna put it? Um, they had a permit to keep it on the National Mall that was only good for two weeks, which had long since passed by the time. The other issue was who's going to pay for it. The National Girl Scout organization thought, yes, yeah, this would be really nice to have, but it's a house. It comes with no money. It's not in our budgets. We didn't know this gift was coming. How are we gonna pay for it? We're gonna need employees. We're going to need staff there. And the biggest question is where are you going to put it? The national organization and Lou argued this, debated back and forth throughout the summer and into the fall of 1922. 
And within the correspondence between Lou and her fellow Girl Scout officials, there are repeated, repeated um, bequests and requests and begging from the National Parks people, please get this off the National Mall, please, Mrs. Hoover, please do this. Eventually, Lou just got frustrated and decided this is something the Girl Scouts need. And she announced that she would cover the expenses for it for the first two years. And very quietly, she donated $12,000, which was used to move the house uh, from behind, uh, as you can see from the White House, over to New York Avenue. Uh, it's neck, it was um, 1750 New York Avenue, which is across from the Octagon House. Um, if you're an architect, you probably know the building. It was also about two blocks from the White House. Uh, Lou had called on the Phillips family that are philanthropists here in Washington who, were, who owned this particular piece of land that was empty, that was made available to the Girl Scouts throughout the, the um, existence of the little house. Lou came up with all sorts of, of arguments trying to persuade her fellow Girl Scout board members to do this. But my favorite one is this. Considering the opposition we have had in many quarters, particularly with the campfire girls and the Boy Scouts on this very matter of our homemaking propensities or lack of them, I feel that we must accept this, our justification if possible. I love the idea that we weren't domestic enough to, um, unless we accepted this house. It was moved over finally, um, ready to go in the spring of 1923. Uh, First Lady Grace Coolidge was very game and came and laid the ceremonial cornerstone under the kitchen and they installed a time capsule in there as well. Um, one of the things that Lou had had to do, not just moving the building, have it pay for it to be moved physically, um, they created a basement. Uh, so it was a fully furnished and usable basement. Uh, electrical hookups, utilities, everything. She, she paid for out of her own pocket. By being first lady, um, Grace Coolidge was involved in quite a, few, quite a few events with the Girl Scouts. She loved the idea. She was really excited when she got her first uniform and insisted on as much gold braid in, that she could possibly manage as honorary national president since there wasn't an official uniform for that person in that role. I, I just love this stuff. I always think they look like they're really up to trouble, uh, doesn't it? But anyway, so we had the model house, all those bedrooms and such, and it became a real hub of activities for the Girl Scouts in the Washington area. It also provided a location in the nation's capital to welcome Girl Scouts from across the country. Um, Lou even had the idea at first that they would, the troops come, could come visit and pit, pitch tents on the lawn. But having that done two blocks from the White House just didn't go over very well. So she had to abandon that idea very quickly. But other things definitely went on. The best way to describe the little house is as a laboratory. Um, it was supposed to be um, so halfway between uh, a girl's playhouse and a woman's marital home. Uh, not play, not full, not full housekeeping yet, but a way of training to do this. And in addition to girl programs, there were adult trainings held regularly. Um, I've got quite a few images here I do want to share about the little house. And that's because um, they are newly discovered. Um, there had been a series of six scrapbooks kept um, in the years that the little house operated that had disappeared and been lost within the Girl Scout archival system until last summer. And these are priceless. And I'm so excited to be able to share them with you. But some of the things that you could do within how within here um, were various dinners. Um, different groups would come. There would be um, one of the most, I guess, one of the uh, one that comes out to my mind first was uh, I think it was a twenty-five cent luncheon that was served uh, by the cooked, prepared, planned by the girls, and served um, to Eleanor Roosevelt in that time. And you can see here in the house. Uh, girls in their khaki uniforms. And this house, it, this was no playhouse. It was very thoroughly furnished. Everything from fancy wallpaper down to the dishes. Other things you could do. There was a nursery 
And during Girl Scout week each year, there were always demonstrations that were done. Usually wives of various government officials would be, would be brought in at least for the photo ops. But here we have demonstrations of childcare, demonstrations of cooking. Um, I love the old stove there on the left. It's huge and it's wonderful. Uh, there's some pictures where the girls have the, the oven doors open and they're pulling cookies and other things out. Um, and it's all, it's all aspects of housekeeping. Um, we had your own facility here in the basement where a girl could earn her laundress badge, uh, one that was dropped a few years back. Um, there also was um, a garden behind it. Um, not only was it just a beautiful place, um, a beautiful respite here in the, in the nation's capital in the main city, but it was a memorial garden. Um, stones, plants, rocks, and things were sent in from across the United States or troops would bring one of their plants, uh, one of their native plants with them when they came to visit and would leave it behind. Another very popular and very well covered event um, at Little House was Thanksgiving dinner for the Hoovers, excuse me, for um, the Coolidges in 1925. Now this year, this year, when the president and first lady wanted a nice fresh turkey for Thanksgiving, they didn't do DoorDash, but they did go for, for delivery. They wanted a turkey from Vermont, their home state. And the idea was some farm that the Coolidges knew were going to provide a turkey. And then the girls within Washington were going to cook a full dinner uh, for Thanksgiving and serve it to the Coolidge's, several other, um, uh, several um, cabinet officers, cabinet secretaries and their wives, uh, the head of the Boy Scouts was there. And somehow this poor girl was selected. Um, this is 13 year old um, Leona Baldwin, who had to ride a train all the way down from Vermont with a live turkey in the basket. I don't know if live turkey would be better than uh, otherwise, but it, she really looks like this was quite an ordeal, I think. Um, the dinner in any case was a tremendous success. Um, the local Girl Scouts had at the time been in the middle of a fundraising campaign, trying to raise actually $20,000 to build their own resident camp. They did not have their own territory. So Mrs. Coolidge thought this would be an excellent way to highlight and feature the girls and the Girl Scouts. And it, was, it worked very well. Lou was very taken with the idea of the Girl Scout Little House. And in 1930, she had a model dollhouse size version created that was to be sent around the United States to different councils so that they could see what exactly she was talking about and be able to um, build their own. The house opened on both sides and had furniture within it that duplicated what was there um, in person in the real in the real one. Um, this is the dining room of the actual uh, little house. And this is the dining room in the doll house. And the whole doll house is just exquisite. It was very well kept, but it was also extremely fragile. It did not make very far. Um, after about two months on tour, it was returned uh, to the little house and just to be put on display there because it was too fragile. Although the Little House was a tremendous success, the national organization decided to close it down in 1945. It was becoming um, too difficult to operate um, and it was really out of capacity for anything. Um, and the building was going to remain for another 10 years being used as offices, but no more for girls programs, no more for trainings, no more for, for publicity information. Yeah, a few more close-ups here. When, when um, the little house closed, most of the contents of it that were, that were still related to programs in Girl Scout history were sent to Rockwood National Camp. Um, anybody who knows me knows Rockwood is my favorite subject to talk about and naturally I can work it into any conversation. But the contents of, um, the, little, of the little house were sent to Rockwood. Um, Part of it, the, the two buildings you see here still exist today out in Potomac, Maryland. Um, 
and they were nice. There were all sorts of interesting office equipment and um, some very good uh, kitchenware because the little house at one point had a cafeteria in the basement that was used to generate extra income for operating expenses. But the little house, dollhouse, the people at Rockwood just couldn't see why they needed it. And they decided it needed to go and they put it on the trash pile. There was one of the housekeepers, Mrs. Maud Hill at Rockwood, saw this beautiful dollhouse on the trash and said, you know, may I have it? Is it okay if I take it out of the trash? I also clean houses for a family that lives about a mile down the road. And they have a little girl who would really love it. I think it was just perfect. They, they did. This uh, was sent to Dorothy uh, from the Dorothy Angel. Her family uh, was the Angel family. She uh, contacted me actually about five years ago. Out of the blue, she'd seen something on my blog to tell me that the little house had come to her, that she had kept it, not broken a single piece of furniture, and uh, taken care of it and loved it. And she sent me all the pictures that you've seen here of the interior and gave me a lot of nice uh, stories about uh, Mrs. Hill and about uh, Girl Scout experience that she had at the time. When she grew up and grew out of it, uh, the question then became, well, now what we do with it? But conveniently, coincidentally, her father happened to be the deputy archivist of the United States. And long story short, the dollhouse was saved and is now at the Hoover Library there in Iowa. Mrs. Hoover kept coming to any event that was possible at the little house. Uh, tree planting in the, in the garden, obviously here. Uh, when you look through the old pictures, you can tell if she's there as the national president of the Girl Scouts because she's in uniform, or here she's first lady, obviously, because she's in civilian clothing. But just to her left is Mrs. Mary Flather who was um, one of the leaders in the Washington Council. And she was the, the person in charge of funding and developing this new residential camp. She recruited Lou, who's very interested in it. Um, the camp was secured. Um, it's down near Harrisonburg, Virginia, still in use today, known as Camp Mayflather. And Lou was especially interested because it was in the Blue Ridge Mountains along with her camp Rapidan. So it was easy for her to go back and forth every now and then to see the place. Lou came for the dedication of the camp. And not only was she there in spirit and in, and in person just to celebrate it, she also was a donor. Um, here is a copy of the invitation for the dedication ceremony. Um, it was a big deal at camp. Everybody dressed perfectly. Everybody wanted to be at camp in that session. We've got a group of girls here ready for the flag ceremony, including the official Girl Scout pupil. Um, when the time came, uh, Lou cut a garland of mountain laurel that had been strung across the bridge, and she led everyone in a sort of parade across of it. You can see them there. The bridge has washed out a time or two, but it's always rebuilt. It's still there. Um, I have been to Mayflower myself. I've seen it, but um, I think it would be best if we could have somebody tell you about it. Um, the woman here is named Marguerite Hall, and she was there at the opening. Let's see if this works. I'm from Georgia, and I was a campsite girl. I knew nothing about food at low, and I knew where Savannah was, but I didn't know that there were any Girl Scouts over there. But I found Girl Scouting when I needed a job. I went to school during the Depression, and I had, I thought I was going to make a lot of money at a campsite camp. It was all $50 for the summer. Now, I was down in Albany, Georgia, and that camp was up in Aurora, New York. And how I thought I was going to get back and forth with <laughs> only $50, I didn't know. But anyway, the uh, Girl Scout director from Washington came out to interview us students uh, from uh, Margaret Webster School. And somehow or other, she decided that she wanted me to come. So she, when she said, I'll pay, I told her that I had a job. And she said, uh, well, we'll pay you $50. And I thought, oh my Lord, oh, $50, that's twice as much as you can. <laughs> and I was not mercenary, but I needed the money in those days. 
So I said, well, I would write and cancel my contract, which I did. And that is how I got into Rose County. I was the first year at Meet Lava. We, the first thing that we did when we went to camp was to learn how to kill a snake. I mean, to trap a snake. We made snake stick, sticks because that, the camp was first open and oh, they were the rattlers all over the place. And so we made these snake sticks and we learned how to treat a snake bite. Those were the first things that all of us learned when we went to Meek Lava. And I had a wonderful summer there and I decided that the Girl Scouts were for me. And from that moment on, I was with the Girl Scouts. Fortunately for us. Well, you have a couple other. With Lou Henry Hoover. And that was a real experience because she and her husband were scouts from the beginning. And she was in the White House at that time. And the White House was open to the Girl Scouts and she would walk over to, and in those days, she didn't have a bodyguard or anything. She would just come over to visit with us, you know, from the White House. And I remember the first time that I really had a chance to know her and be with her. We, uh, the Girl Scouts made garments for the Needlework Guild. And we had hundreds and hundreds of these garments that we would make. And at Christmas, we had an end gathering. And then uh, the ladies from the needlework here would come over and we'd have a great big party. I don't know whether you all knew 825 M Street, but it had a beautiful, beautiful, it had been a, an artist studio and it had this huge, huge room. And that was what we met in. It was a great big fireplace. We had the fireplace burning and we were waiting for the ladies to come over. It started snowing. We had the heavy snowstorm of the season. Not one lady appeared, but guess who came through the snow? All of the girls and Lou Henry Hoover. <laughs> and we had a beautiful time. She talked to the girls about their days in Alaska and you know, she and her husband had traveled all over the world and it was just one beautiful evening. So I came into Girl Scouting with Lou Henry Hoover. And uh, want me to go on? I've got more to say. And then, it was the first year of Camp Mayflava, and we had built a bridge, the, the Lou Henry Hoover Bridge, and we were dedicating it. And she said that she would not take an indoor meal if she was going to eat a meal out. She wanted to be cooked out of doors. So all of the units were given a certain course, and my unit had um, the dessert. And we were going to do an upside down cake and reflect the oven. And everything was going fine, you know, we mixed it up and we had some sherry to go in it. It was just going to be great. But all of a sudden, it started raining and it poured and it poured. And so I thought, oh, they're coming, they're coming and what am I going to do? So the fire went out and I was down on my knees, blowing it, blowing it, blowing it. And they have, you know, the, the public relations people come first. And the public relations people got there and got me with my very ass. <laughs> 30 years later, I was out in California. I was on the National Girl Scout staff. And I was out in California and visiting a um, regional director who was a friend of the Hoovers. And her sister said to me, would you like to go over to the Lou Henry Hoover, uh, the, the Hoover Memorial at Stanford University? And I said, I would love to. She said, I think you were with the Girl Scouts when Lou Henry was uh, in Washington, weren't you? And I said, yes. She said, well, you would be very interesting. We have a Lou Henry Hoover room and we have a corner that's given over to Camp Meek Lava. I said, well, I'd love to see it. And so we were admiring everything and all of a sudden we came to the corner and she had this big blown up picture of the reflector oven. <laughs> <laughs> and guess who there is? And she said, you know, one day the person that's in this picture is going to walk in here and see herself. And I said, she just did. <laughs> Of the day. Memorial. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. So that gives you an idea of, uh, of people's devotion to Lou. And here she is leaving Camp Mayflather. Um, other things that Lou did, um, 
in addition to promoting the little house, to promoting camping in general, to promoting professionalism, was to support cookie sales. Um, the, first, the first commercially baked cookie sales took place in Philadelphia in 1932. Uh, and it was such a success that she promoted the idea of commercially made cookies um, across the country. Previously, uh, it had tended to be the girls bake the cookies themselves. Um, so in order to have a much uh, uh, larger sale, larger income, it was turned to the commercial thing. Um, incidentally, the group, as I said, was in Philadelphia. And one of the people who was in charge of making the, the drive and making it national was our friend Helen, back from uh, the Troop 8 and the survivor of the, um, the crash, the collapse of the, of the uh, roof at the theater. That act of heroism is, was also commemorated here in Washington, in the Washington area. Um, a good friend of Helen's mother, who is seated here, um, was so inspired by Helen's bravery and by the Girl Scout movement in general that she gave her um, estate to the Girl Scouts, and that's this Rockwood camp. As far as I know, Lou never came to Rockwood herself, but when uh, she and her husband decided to leave Camp Rapidan and to um, relocate back to California permanently in 1941, she sent a collection of over 200 items um, as a donation to Rockwood. Um, there was no actual place uh, to put them all on display at the time. So they were uh, put in, into storage where they stayed until 1954 when uh, they were brought back out. This is the Hoover room that was dedicated to Lou at Rockwood. Um, and um, definitely the chairs on either side of the fireplace um, came from Rapidan. We're not as, I'm not as sure about the sort of wicker, uh, lightweight looking chairs. Uh, but they did say that the two in front of the fireplace were possibly the most uncomfortable chairs uh, ever made. Um, you couldn't sit on it without the padding because they were so uncomfortable, but you'd sit on the padding and you would immediately be slid out and deposited on the floor. Um, one of the other things that's uh, interesting, keep in, keep in mind, uh, the chandeliers here. Um, the, the legend for the chandeliers is that they came out of the old British embassy in Washington because the, the, the woman who owned this was very thrifty and it was upcycling long before it was, was important. But over time, stories get confused and it became the, the, the legend became that the chandelier came from Camp Rapidan. I don't know how many people actually would have chandeliers in a camp but the items that she sent was definitely things they didn't want. Um, they weren't gonna pay to ship overseas and there was no chandelier in there. Uh, the decision was made in 1954 to dedicate a room to, to Lou um, there at, at Rockwood. One of the th things the staff had to do was pull all of the furniture out of storage and tag it. Um, you can see down here, there's a brass tag um, that, um, uh, that was used to identify everything. Then there was going to be a dedication ceremony where they had um, Lou's granddaughter to come um, and to unveil this portrait that was made of Lou. Um, this was uh, based on a photo. And when the portrait was made, a staff member at Rockwood was told she had to find out uh, the name of the dog. And it took her about three months in order to do it. Um, she said it was a Norwegian elk hound named uh, Ouija. And no girl ever asked her the name of the dog while she was at the camp. Somewhere along the line at Rockwood, things got switched around and this became the portrait that was done, um, the portrait that was hanging at Rockwood. This one was done about the same time in 1952 as a full length portrait. And the Girl Scout National uh, Headquarters decided they wanted to hang it in their offices, but they didn't want the whole thing. So they cut it in half. Um, I'm not sure if Lou's lower half is wandering around someplace or somewhere in the archives, but this is the picture that was there. And you notice no L count. Uh, here again, is a thing of, of the chandeliers um, that continue to be one of Lou's, uh, um, one of her legacies at Rockwood. Um, 
at the same time that they dedicated the house, uh, the room to her, they also created um, one of the Lou Henry Hoover um, Memorial's Wildlife Sanctuaries and Forests. That's a program that was started by the Girl Scouts uh, where an organization can take a particular defined area and um, invest in new plants, new trees and such um, with the encouragement and the recognition um, of the Girl Scouts. Uh, and this is where we end. I said, I'm, I'm always up for Rockwood. And yes, this is why my book is finally coming out. But Lou Henry Hoover definitely was a strong influence on Girl Scouting in Washington. She laid the foundation that allowed the organization to sustain itself past the life of its founder. The, and she can still be, her influences and her, her traces are still very evident today, especially at cookie time. Thank you so much. That's a great presentation on there. Um, I, I think we do have a few questions yet, if, you, if you've got time, Ann, on there. Well, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Well, let me see. The first question I've got is from Gail, and she had, has Bill, Jill Biden been recognized as an honorary president yet? Supposedly, she has has been asked. I'm not sure if um, there has been an answer yet, but um, the, all indications were that she was interested. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. And, and then, um, uh, of course, Library Director Tom Schwartz is listening in, um, and he goes, uh, "Did Lou use the Girl Scouts to assist in depression relief? And have any other First Ladies used the Girl Scouts to assist in highlighting their particular causes?" Not to the degree that Lou did. Um, she had this um, program that she came out with around 1929 called the Rapidan Plan, was to send Girl Scouts out in the communities to um, help with poverty alle alleviation and such. Um, it really quickly became a problem too big for girls to handle. Um, other you know, presidents uh, and first ladies that have had a particular cause uh, like literacy with Barbara Bush, um, have done some uh, photo ops with the Girl Scouts, but nothing nearly as, as involved as uh, ra the rapid end plan with, with Lou. Okay. And then uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, writes, why did the Little House homemaking program fall out of fashion? Was it related to any decline in popularity of uh, homemaking programming in the Girl Scouts in general? I don't think so. Um, it was... Um, becoming uh, you know, a victim of its own popularity. Um, there were so many troops that were forming in the late forties uh, that it couldn't accommodate. And they were turning too many people away. Well, you got a lot of comments, a lot of thank yous uh, uh, in our comments note. I think we've answered pretty much all the questions that we've had uh, on there. Um, anyway, um, let's see, uh, Pam writes, our, she said, our camp was named a Lou Henry Wildlife Sanctuary and then she's, she asked, do you know if Girl Scouts still recognize this? I believe they do. Um, okay. I know, yes, I believe they do. <laughs> okay, great, great. Well, I think that pretty well covers all the questions we got, Anne. Again, thank you so much um, for that. So again, I'd like to thank our speaker, Ann Robertson, for a presentation tonight, and also all of the public libraries who helped make tonight's program a success. Remember, the Presidential Library is now open seven days a week, 9 to 5 p.m., and I invite you to visit a new special temporary exhibit now called Deliverance, America and the Famine in Soviet Russia, 1921 to 1923, featuring numerous accounts of humanitarian efforts by Herbert Hoover and the American Relief Administration as they worked to feed 11 million people a day 100 years ago. It is fascinating when you put it up against the backdrop of what we have happening in Ukraine today. And don't forget to join us on Sunday, June 26th, when author and historian Annette Dunlap comes to West Branch to discuss her new Lou Henry Hoover biography. It's an opportunity for you to meet the author in person and get your copy signed. The Hoover Presidential Foundation staff is always here, ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover campus and museum renovation. And you can learn more about that and even show your support at timelessvaluescampaign.org. On behalf of all of us here at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we thank you for joining us tonight and look forward to your next visit to the Hoover campus. Thank you. <laughs>